Yeah. Mm -hmm. It should be. Oh, it went out of the way. Good morning. Um, I think we're still waiting on a couple people, but I think we can get going um, with introductions. So um, I'm Jamie Fitch, the um, town sustainability manager and um, Autumn Spear, our planning director and I are kind of tag teaming this effort. So thank you all for um, being here today. Um, we can start off with a round of introductions. We'll go around the table um, and then we'll go to Zoom. So if Emerson, if you want to start. Hi, I'm Emerson. I'm a sustainability fellow through AmeriCorps. Working with you. My name is Darren Grout. I, I uh, sit on the Coastal Waters Committee and the Shellfish Committee and I'm representing both right now. Darren Shoup, I'm the Front Health Liaison. Jessica Kimball, Consultant of Fusion. Judy Colby George, Consultant of Fusion. Michael Kane, I'm president of the Scarborough Fish and Game Association. Hi, everybody. I'm Maggie Bishnow. I'm the founder of the Conservation Commission. I'm Cassie Maurer, and I'm from the Scarborough Trust. Andrew Mackey, executive director of the Scarborough Land Trust. Karen Martin, I'm uh, executive director of the Scarborough Development Development Corporation. Uh, I'm Spirit Planning Director for the Cow. And since you snuck in, would you like to introduce? <laughs> Thank you. And Patricia. Yes, my name is Trish Brigham um, and I am representing the Community Services Advisory Board. I apologize that I cannot be there in person, but this is probably one of my worst work weeks of the whole entire year and I've got another <laughs> meeting at 10. So I apologize, I need to, we'll be jumping off and I apologize for any disruption. Well, thanks for making the time to join us for as long as you can. Um, so, I think we've sent out a little bit of information about what um, the our goal is for our open space plan, um, but we will recap a little bit. Um, so as you all should be aware, back in June of 2023, the town council passed a resolution um, with a goal of um, conserving at least 30% of Scarborough's um, land by 2030, also known as 30 by 30. Um, and so this open space plan um, is going to be an important step for us um, to understand and provide strategies for 
how we can achieve that, if we can achieve that. Um, and so um, that's that's one goal of this process. The others are to identify um, kind of important areas or focus areas where um, we may want to pursue conservation efforts. Um, and so looking at um, our um, town as a whole, looking at what's currently conserved, identifying op other opportunities for additional conservation, um, both in terms of kind of habitat and connectivity um, and natural resources, and then also thinking in terms of climate change and marsh migration and things like that. So a whole host of reasons um, for why we should be conserving um, areas in Scarborough. Um, and so kind of developing like a heat map with um, high priority, medium priority and low priority areas for conservation. And then also looking at the town's ordinances to figure out if we can um, encourage more conservation um, through our through our ordinances um, and through land development if there's opportunities to either require um, conservation set-asides or things like that. Just thinking um, kind of outside the box for how we might be able to um, increase land conservation in Scarborough. Um, and then it is called the open space plan. So it's not just going to focus on conserved lands. We're also going to look at um, public access um, and recreation and things like that. Um, and so we'll have some discussions um, today about, um, about what is open space um, and where um, we kind of want, where we want um, this plan to go. Um, did I miss anything, Autumn? No. Okay, good. Um, so at this point, I will turn it over to our um, consulting team from Viewshed and you can take it away. Um, so, uh, my name is Jeffrey Van Kimball. Um, I'm a landscape architect and planner, Fuget and the M Project Manager. We hold George, the owner of Fuget, and will be running all of the um, GIS um, spatial and other little components of the plan, um, as well as conducting uh, public engagement. And then this is Madeline Tripp. Um, she is also with Fuget and is doing um, all the support work and put together the presentation that you're, um, we're going to be presenting today. And so um, today, just to kind of throw the agenda up, what we're looking to do is um, give you an overview of the project so you understand timeline goals, kind of the approach, um, make sure everything feels comfortable, ask any questions along the way. We're going to look at the existing conditions of, uh, in Scarborough, where is their existing open space, We'll talk a little bit about what qualifies as open space. Are all of the areas that we've identified, are they in fact something that we want to consider as open space? And we'll look at all of the existing open space in, in relation to that goal, that 2030 goal, so that um, to give you an understanding of what exists and then what do we need to do by 2030 if we're going to meet that goal. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about our approach, which is um, looking to merge the data, um, this geospatial data, um, with the community values to develop the prioritization around open space. We'll actually look at that data, um, show you what we've got, ask if we've missed anything, and then we'll talk about the community engagement process um, so that you can see um, how we're going to kind of extract the values I get out of the community. So um, this is our introduction page. So everybody's up on the screen here. We already went around and um, made introductions, but um, a really nice group of people representing a broad range of um, existing committees. So thank you all for participating. Um, and talking about the plan goals, and I know that Jamie went over a lot of this already, but um, just to kind of touch base um, again here in the green box at the top of the screen, we're um, first looking to give you a comprehensive inventory of the existing open spaces and the resources. We um, want to, in this plan, outline the strategies for achieving that 30 by 30 goal. Uh, as part of that, we'll be identifying the highest priority areas for conservation, that heat map um, uh, analogy that Jamie made. Um, in addition to identifying priority areas, we also want to give strategies for ways that we can um, expand conservation and acquisition of open space. 
Um, we will be looking at the ordinances uh, and looking at a potential impact fee structure as part of this um, so that we can fund the acquisition and conservation of open space. Um, and ideally, this then guides some potential um, capital improvements, investments, and then funding opportunities um, as well. So those are kind of the goals as we understand it in the plan. And um, the process is driven by both geospatial data and community engagement. This is a schedule of the um, of the project. So we are sitting um, at that first blue dot there in May. The blue dots across the top are our I guess we have five meetings. Our one in June will be in online only, and um, we'll meet again then as planned now, August, September, and then one final time in November. Um, the green is that public engagement process. So we're shooting to have a public meeting in July, and we'll have two digital rounds of engagement. We'll talk about this at the very end of what that means, and then we'll have a final presentation. Um, and then the four um, colored bars at the bottom sort of represent sort of the different phases of our process. So we've been collecting data. That's what you're seeing today. That's what's being presented. We're then going to get into the mapping analysis work, talk about conservation, priorities, and strategies. Our meetings in late summer, early fall with you, I think are going to be focusing a lot around that orange bar. Like what are the recommendations we want to make around strategies? Um, simultaneously, we'll be conducting that ordinance review and then really drafting the plan this fall with an aim to have it completed um, before Christmas and then likely a presentation to, to town council in the early uh, part of the year. So you haven't committed to too much time here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we get into the fun stuff. Um, so how big is Scarborough? I know that this was a question um, that we had to figure out before we could figure out how to conserve 30% of Scarborough. <laughs> Uh, and so, as you all know, I'm sure, you know, um, technically the that town boundary goes all the way out into the open water. We figured that wasn't something we were looking to conserve. So uh, what we did was extract um, anything that's in the light blue, the water coming up through Scarborough Marsh as it kind of follows those tributaries, that is not included. That's open water, and that is not included in the town land area. So in that green uh, area that you see, it's uh, over 30,000, just over 30,000 acres. So that is what 100% uh, of the town is. And now how much of that land is currently conserved? This map shows all of the areas that are um, uh, cons what we've classified as open space um, that are on land or um, non-marsh are shown in purple. And the marsh is shown in green. We just kind of wanted to show with this map how much uh, uh, percentage of the area really is marsh. A big part of the open space land that exists is within this marsh area. Even when we extract for water, it's still a substantial chunk. Oh, please interrupt at any point. So the purple land is, um, is, is the potential for this green. That is the existing open space. The existing. That is, the, and we'll break it down for you so you can understand in a little, in a little more detail what that is. Yep. And then when you say conserve, does it actually have some sort of um, permanency to it, or is it just that it's not developed yet? We'll talk about it. But okay. Okay. Most of it is conserved except for one category, which is um, some municipal land, which doesn't necessarily have conservation associated with it. But the arrest has some sort of either easement or it, its status is legally conserved. Correct. It's like Rachel Carson or, yeah. So we'll, and I'll, we'll go into all the details so you can talk about it. Um, and if you still have questions after we look at all of it, yeah, then we'll, yeah. So these are the numbers. Um, there's the blue bar at the top, that's the total land area. The green bar in the middle shows what is, and I say conserved today, but it's really what is existing open space. It doesn't necessarily mean that there is um, a conservation easement on all of that land, but it is um, owned by the town or public entity or conserved privately. Okay. The um, 9% of that is marsh, and um, the total area conserved is 24% of the town. So 7,500 acres is conserved, that is 24% of 30,000. So if you have a 30 by 30 goal, it's looking pretty good. We've already made it 24% of the way to 30%. If we are going to meet the goal by 3030, we need to conserve an additional 1,700 acres. How does that feel? 
I think it'll be good to have the discussion about the protected versus, um, yeah. Excuse me, are marshes considered waters of the state? So um, open water is considered waters of the state. Wetlands over a certain size are considered waters of the state. Um, there are still, there's still some, there's still some development potential and like ability to fill uh, wetlands and things like that. So the area in green that's on here, um, most of that is protected by either the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife or the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So we're we're taking we're taking credit for those 2750 acres even though you can't really build on them anyway. There's already I don't know. I I don't necessarily agree with that, but we'll get to it. We are taking credit for it, Robin right now. <laughs> we can choose whether or not we want to take credit yeah. for it is really and that's why we've broken it down. We okay. You see the marsh in relation to everything here. And then here we've separated it out. So you can see that the upland area, um, the area in purple is equal to that 4,700 acres. And that green area that is not open water, but state owned marsh um, is the 2,700 acres. I mean, it would be one thing if it was a beach, you know, like Crescent Beach or something, but you know, marsh, you can, can you hunt in it? I mean, yeah, you can actually. Okay, so you can hunt and fish in there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm still not buying it, but okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll have a discussion. This is kind of our starting point and we'll... Understood. Thank you. Where the starting point was, if we chose to remove the marsh, we would be at 15% of conservation potentially. And so it just is a different jumping off point. Um, you could also say that we don't want to include that marsh as part of the town boundary at all. And so actually our town boundary is 2,700 acres less than that 30,000. And that's actually what we're going to use. And so um, we can play with the math, <clears throat> um, but ultimately this is a starting point and for us to, to um, look at how to develop strategies to expand the conservation efforts in the community. So now getting into the the breakdown of the um, of that first map that just showed that purple and green where all of the purple was one. Now it's been broken out here into um, six different categories. So we have um, federally federal land. We have um, two categories of municipal land. We'll get into it. We have a category that we call designated open space. Um, private conservation areas, and then land with the state. So this slide is sort of a breakdown of what we mean in each of those categories. And we can kind of bounce back between um, the, the definitions and examples here versus where it's actually located. <laughs> so federal is pretty self-explanatory, land owned and managed uh, by the federal government. In uh, Scarborough, it's primarily just that Rachel Carson Preserve. Um, down below, the state land, also pretty self-explanatory, land owned and managed by state agencies. Uh, example of this would be Scarborough Marsh, 3,000 acres. Um, and then the two blocks in the middle, we have municipal and recreation, and they're both owned by the town. So those two purple blocks are the pink and red in the middle, are um, town owned land. So municipal is the undeveloped land and it may or may not be protected. So your question about whether or not it's all under conservation, yeah. there is undeveloped land owned by the town that could just, they could be developed tomorrow for nothing. There's nothing preventing that. Um, the, um, it's a total of, let's see, so this is 300 acres in total. If we look at the map here, um, it is, and I don't, these areas don't necessarily have names because they are just undeveloped chunks of land, but we're looking at um, here's a here's a spot, here's a big chunk. That looks like part of the sport and basketball. Which would be um sorry, is that what this one is? No. Okay. I just thought it was part. And that might be in recreation. <laughs> That's 
So what we've tried to do is distinguish between undeveloped and those that are parks for recreation. Um, so we, it's, it's not a ton of land area, but it looks kind of like we have maybe five sort of areas. And then there's a little piece right here. So it's not a ton of land like in total that is owned by the town that's not in conservation, but it's something. It is, um, I guess, not all of this, um, of those 300 acres, some of them are conserved and some of them aren't. We don't necessarily know which ones might have conservation easements yeah. or not. Right. So, um, Lee. Why did the town only for no reason? Or, or. <laughs> <laughs> or is there a yeah, some of it is um, acquired because people didn't pay their taxes, so their property got um, got seized essentially. Um, others, um, for example, the town purchased um, the old um, Grange Hall on Route One because you know there wasn't. Um, it was for sale. They didn't want to lose the historical value. The town purchased it. Um, there may be opportunities to develop future parks. There may be opportunities for passive recreation um, on some of the parcels. Um, in some cases, when a subdivision is um, developed, they have designated open space. A couple of cases, they've um, deeded that over to the town. Um, so there's lots of different reasons for it. The purple box down below, that's recreation. So we've tried to parse out the areas that are currently parks, um, school fields, playground, boat launches, courts. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's in conservation either. Just because it's used as a park doesn't mean that there's a conservation easement. I think it would be maybe a bigger political move to take a park and develop it as opposed to just undeveloped land and um, develop it. But um, these two boxes in the center here, they... Um, are not necessarily in conservation. I see Robin is raising her hand. Uh, yeah, yeah, the designated, um, well, municipal and designated and private. Um, have we have we done analysis to see if this is legally conserved? That runs with the land on the developer. I know Jamie said sometimes the developers hand over the land to the town, but have we made sure that there are covenants on the properties? I'll take it as a no. No, we're we're answering. Hold on. <laughs> so the designated um, open space, those are oh, that's the box we haven't got to yet. Yeah, that's all the teal. Yeah, stick with the so so um, in the municipal. Do we know um, which ones have conservation easements and which ones don't? So most of the recreation ones don't. Um, the other municipal ones sometimes it's kind of unclear. And so there are a handful that do have conservation details that we know that they do, but there are a handful of properties that we're not sure if they have. So we can park that out. We can make it so it's like another category of like municipal undeveloped that's conserved, municipal um, undeveloped, unconserved. And we can also do the same thing with recreation, like recreation conserved, recreation unconserved. And what we have to Right, well, so all the best <laughs> data that we have that we're going to work with is the state um, database for conservation lands, and it is only as good as the data input. So going above and beyond to do deed research is not within the scope of work that we're going to do. Um, if that's something that the town wants to take on, it certainly can. Um, no, I, I recognize that it's not within your scope, but I, I do believe that it's something that the town should look at and um, a lot the appropriate money because otherwise you know sometimes these plans sit on a shelf and um it, it compromises their integrity if um the conservation easement doesn't run with the land and furthermore i guess maybe we'll get into it too just because there's no activity on it doesn't mean that it can't be considered conserved but maybe these are these are points that we'll take up later. Yeah, I want to clarify because I thought we were be identifying land that we would be able to conserve, but if we don't know if it's conserved or not, are we just identifying land that we could conserve or we already need to conserve? Um, I think if I can just, uh, yeah, this is kind of where you are today, right? So this is a baseline. This is what we have.
have municipal, we have 300 acres. Of those 300 acres, I know that we, there's not very many parts that we actually have the deed, we can go ahead and look and find out if they're there. But as part of this process, should we make sure the rest of the, the municipal owned land is in conservation? So that's an action implementation. But I think this is really just a baseline to get us to the next part of the conversation, which is do you all agree that a recreational field should be counted towards open space? So I think this is just sort of an introduction. I think we're all really excited and getting ahead. To right. That is actually <laughs> the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Things to get there. Yeah. And we just broke it down as like yeah. but enough detail to give you an idea of it and we can parse it out further. Because I would envision at the end of this, like recreation fields are not going to count towards 20, uh, our 2030 goal, but we want to acknowledge that they exist and they're still good thing to So that's kind of, I think, part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was looking up there. Uh, the, the land trust, I thought, would have been up there. So it's under five. Is it it's okay. Are uh, those two examples? They're just two examples. Just examples. Yeah. Like they're not yeah. only. The no, we just threw okay. a couple up. It's gone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Here's more examples. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Actually, before I jump over to this one, I just the designated open space. That's that's the last one. So private is the land trust for uh, main farm land trust, and then in the bottom right, that's designated open space, and that is land that's held as open space as part of subdivisions. Who owns it? Whether it's conserved, whether it's it, that's we haven't gotten that far into understanding it, but it's land that through a subdivision process they're not allowed to develop on. So I think they're in pretty good shape in assuming those cannot be developed. I I do want to just clarify. <laughs> Those open space lands go way some go way back in time, and they're all over the board in terms of restrictions. The designated open space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of them have clear restrictions that are listed. Um, others say it was open space, but that doesn't define what that means and whether the homeowners association or whoever managed that could do anything on it. Right. And uh, the big thing is who enforces that. Right. There is no good. Enforcement mechanism for homeowners association open space lands. Yeah. I mean, just an example of the designated that we know about. What's the like what's what's one of the most important designated in subdivision park or a subdivision park or subdivision? Yeah, like Lake Farm has a designated HOA, they say, and then they also have a part of the land that they dedicated to the town for open space. Okay. And then the town connects to the Scarborough Land Trust, right? Yeah. So you could envision through this process, um, maybe we create through our ordinances a specific way that HOA land is conserved. Yep. And it goes through the development process and the planning department, and we make sure it's um, And then if land is dedicated to the town, maybe we have a specific way that happens. Um, I know that in the development process now, we're trying to work with Scarborough Land Trust instead of having open space willy nilly through HOA. We're like, hey, dedicated to the Scarborough Land Trust because we know how it's going to be administered. So all that will, like, yeah. the sense of the past kind of yeah. inform how to yeah, I just, yeah, you that question. I, think it was, I, I just wondered, like, Kind of like the real life example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can see on this map where that darker green is, like look along the yeah. hot edge of the marsh here. You know, so some of those might be really important because they may, even though they're dedicated space from a subdivision, that might be good marsh migration mm -hmm. yeah. areas, right? So, yeah. so those are probably important. And I think one of the things to think about is that in the overall process of the project, like we want to know where the spaces are now. Right. Then we're going to analyze it irregardless of what spaces you have to identify where the best places are. And if the two things overlap and you have a piece of town owned land that turns out to be high priority, then yay, low hanging fruit. <laughs> you yeah. know? So I, you know, I so I don't think it's super critical, like even if we don't know for sure whether there's a conservation easement on a piece of property or not right now, you know, if it's town owned, we know that there's certain mm -hmm. kind of, that that the town has access to making decisions about that in a different way. And it does land that's not town owned. So I think when we're thinking, as we think through this process, we want to consider that yes, we want to know where all these are. Then we're going to do this separate process that doesn't have anything to do with parcels. That's going to identify land in another way, and then we're going to see how the two fit together. So the question is: Scarborough Fishing Game, with 250 acres, are we counted now 
or will we not count the account? Because so you said we would be in purple on a rider. Yeah. Are we there or not there? You might get it. So our breakdown of the private is between the main farmland trust, the Scarborough Lane Trust, and then there's the, the back. Is it one of those red pieces? What's that? Is that is the land that you that they own one of those red we pieces? We are across from Beatrice Speedway, so we're on the home road. Wherever you have the home road, usually Beatrice Speedway is very identified. Um, Holmes Road is. <laughs> oh, here's Holmes Road. Yeah. Okay. There's Beatrice Road. There's an intersection of Beatrice and Holmes. Come down a little bit more. Yeah. Keep going out the other way. The right. This one? Nope. No. Nope. Keep going. Right to that intersection right there. Oh, is this Zoom thing? in right there. Right there is it. Okay. Well, it's, and we're not going to get more than I can do yeah. it, but it's not going to give us more detail. <laughs> <laughs> it's that, no, yeah. yeah. So that the road going off the Holmes Road right there. Yeah. That's fish and game lane. That entire area from there to almost to the orange over to 95, that's all fish and game. Yeah. That's 250 yeah. acres right there. Okay. And to give you a little bit of, of about us, because you could absolutely count us, um, we're 250 acres. Um, we have 1,100 members. Uh, we're a training facility for police, U.S., military, everything. Uh, we were developed in 1948 from the sand pit that uh, they took the sand out and used it for the main turnpike. <laughs> uh, we became co co incorporated in 1954. Uh, up to 2023, we were a 501 c 7 not for profit. Uh, in uh, November of 2023, we finally qualified for 501 c 3 um, and what that means is if, if we did not exist, we would have to agree to give our land to another 501c3 or a government entity. So we are absolutely open land protected. Developers can never have. So there's 250 acres for them right there. Greg, what we can do is go into the article data to identify yeah. that. Yeah. So it, it'll be able to show. Thank you. So you know. That's yeah. great. Are there any other parcels beyond that, or is it just the different parcels you guys leave there? It is grouped together in three partial okay. groups, but they're all grouped together and they show up on the path. Yeah, yeah. we can find it. We go there. And uh, we have uh, conservationist yeah. lands with the state also. But they're the same lands. Yeah. And now with the Bible 13C, all of that 250 acres falls into that category. So, yeah. Okay. And we miss Beatrice Speedway, they make more noise than we do. <laughs> <laughs> Is there um, any other basis brief overview? And I know you're looking at maps that are pretty small to see, but. Anything else similarly where um, we may have missed something in the parcels um, that might be another organization that where there would be we have the state conservation plan and we have kind of the um, the the division that you've seen we're able to easily identify the um, Scarborough um, land trust land and the main farm trust land. I'm not seeing the conservation plans, but. What about the golf? Um, the, I don't know if that's a thing. Do they have any buffers around them? Do they have any? I, mean, I wouldn't count that, but I'm just saying. Right. But we didn't include, include, yeah, we didn't include private recreation space because it doesn't have any. There's a thing that could turn it into something else. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we did not include that space. And we had talked um, when kind of we met initially about. Um, the town's ordinances and how our our zoning may limit development. Had, did you do any of that analysis? Not as part of the okay. this preliminary presentation. Okay. When you guys when you pulled up the the uh, fish and game land, mm -hmm. there's another hundred acres behind them that's part of the none such land trust. So when you when you I just pull I end up on GIS. So when you when you pull the isn't that uh, you guys now? Yeah. In Scarborough. 
There's a number that's on um, this map right now. Okay, that's a good stress to search for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll look around. Andrew said it's already captured on here. Is that the, is that the... Yeah. Yeah. No, no, the down. It's a, uh, it's a group of individuals that got together to basically protect one parcel. Uh, we've tried to inquire about the status of the organization. They are listed on the state site as a nonprofit corporation with a uh, address in South Portland. Um, but we've never had any contact with them. We don't know what happens when this group of people respond and uh, as, a, as a 501c3 land. Uh, as you said, um, should not be sold generally, but again, it all comes down to enforcement. If there's no movement, if there's no feedback, right? Yeah. I think that has connection to the fish and game laws. Okay, that was the original members of the board of the fish and game that separated that off and put it in conservation with them. Uh, I don't know the actual reason for it at the time. I know that they moved some of the fish and game uh, uh, ranges uh, to suit the uh, DEP. And I think at that time it was spun off, given its own name, and the leaders of that particular group were also board members of the Fish and Game Association. Um, if you ask me if any of them are still with it, I am not sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But that is a conservation piece. Um, state so, conservation. I was going to say, so there's deed restrictions in place on yes, that parcel. Yes, it is. There's also uh, RJ London back there. That's quite a quite a bit along that river that founders us in the back also. And I know that is conservation land because that was used as mm -hmm. litigation land for other projects. And so I know mean, that's your point. It's, it's slowly becoming town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we have one more there's there's three pieces. They have two pieces of land behind on the other side of the Lunatic River, and then there's a piece of land that's landlocked by the Thomas Starlands that are two acres, right right in uh, the Butler land systems. Mm -hmm. The town right wing. Great to have you guys come with the insight as opposed to us just trying to like parcel search. There's also, I think this was mentioned in our kickoff meeting, but I went through um, all the subdivisions when I first started working and found that the state civil consensus is in the parcel viewer. So there's a sheet um, that I've compiled. Yeah, we'll send that over to you. Was it received in the data that we got from? I thought I sent it, but I may not have. So okay. we'll, um, we'll resend it. Okay. I assume maybe that was the designated open space. I remember you talking about that, and I thought that might have been in there, but you sent it to us. We'll just look and make sure yeah. that, you know. Discussion isn't over. If things come up, or if you like remember all of a sudden, no, there was 100 acres somewhere, I'm like, we should be going at it. <laughs> um, but once you add it, you can't take away. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we can get into a little discussion about um, at this point what is open space. And um uh I don't know that we're gonna end on a final decision today. And I so I don't want to talk about it for the next hour and a half. Um, but we have some printouts of uh the, uh, the, these are the, it's not part of the, the slideshow, but it's examples of open space definitions for other open space plan in Southern Maine. So you can see how different communities have addressed the problem. 
um, <laughs> defining something that was difficult to define. Thank you. Um, Do you have this that you can share on the screen for people who are Zooming? Do, uh, Madeline, can you where this is on our server? Because I can totally put it up. Uh, this. Here, if I want free Wi Fi for us, I can open Wi Fi. Um, but we can certainly have this sent to you afterwards so you can share it. Um, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Good troubleshooting. I'm just, I'm going to take control of your. see if it goes through. Well, you can start and I'll get it up on the screen when I can. Great. So you can see that uh, sometimes the definitions are very nebulous. <laughs> like South Portland, it was like, here are the principles that we care about, uh, protecting water quality and um, conserving um, beaches and frontal marshes and places that enhance recreational opportunities. So this is like very nebulous. Um, Windham at the bottom, you know, they specifically call out developed parks, playgrounds, and recreational fields as important part of their open space um, network. Um, yeah, there is, yeah, there is. Yeah. 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 Bridgeton. 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 We just did Bridgeton. <laughs> Madeline wrote that one. <laughs> So we don't need to be so um, prescriptive in our definition of open space of exactly um, um, you know, these count or they don't count. Um, it can be sort of principally based open space definitions. I think since we're looking at a quantitative goal of conserving a specific amount of the community, I can already tell that there's discussions like, well, does that count? Did we include this or you don't? Um, communities don't always get into that level of quantitative discussion. It's just more like principally based because there isn't necessarily this target. It's just general practices. Um, so if we're looking at that quantitative approach, that target, um, and we're looking at, I guess, um, when we're sharing these definitions now, so I can only jump back over to the examples, but this is good to put up. I guess before we get into the details, is there any like gut reactions to these or? Bridgeton is very pretty, but I cannot administer Bridgeton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do it. And that's where, that's where, but open space dilemma, right? Like open space can be all these things, but if you're trying to get into right. the 20 and 30 goal, you have to have very concrete discounts. Well, and I, I think as we have talked about with Conservation Commission, Open space and uh, 30 by 30 are like the rectangle in the square. So some open space will count towards 30, 30, but not all. And so um, I think that that's um, where we kind of, that's the nuance that we need to tease out. Yep, yeah, perfect. Very pretty sort of description, but then conservation of the space that shall be. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and I think that's important to frame. Yep. What can 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 that person speak up? I can't hear what that person said. Oh, Maggie. I, I said what the Bridgeton one in particular gives it uh, a community value. Um and it's a, it's important to frame things that way. Yep. Because that's the administrative uh, uh, the thing you said yeah. think about it. So I think it's transferring kind of that value statement into concrete um, 
kind of criteria for ordinances. And so I think the plan can be, because it is going to be somewhat public facing, it can be a little bit more um, value-based, but then the part where we get into the, the nitty gritty of how do we actually implement and make this happen, that will be more concrete. Yeah, I think start step two first. And it also guides decisions, correct me if I'm wrong, guides decisions by the town council. And this would like the administrative details. Right. From. And Robin has her hand raised. Yeah, I, I like what Jamie said about um, using the visions and values sort of like to guide uh, the concrete action steps. Um, this is, I, I see this kind of as a strategic plan and capturing the values like Bridgeton did. I, I almost want to do Bridgeton and South Portland. Yeah. You know? Agreed. Where I'm a counselor, I like Windham, where I'm like, okay. <laughs> I especially develop parks, playgrounds, and recreation fields, just like preserving Memorial Park and saying, like, this will be Memorial Park. You know, I sit in a community center meeting, they want to build three things there. I'm like, but if we call this open space, maybe they wouldn't be proposing this location right now. Um, so that's with that, with Windham, that's what it caught me also with like farming. I mean, I don't know what long term farm is designated out of that served land. But if we call it at a minimum open space, we're saying like this open space has value and it's labeled it open space. I like one of these two. <laughs> yeah, I would say that the, you know, it's my understanding that the town council resolution on 30 by 30 was a conservation goal. Yes. Uh, that traces its roots back to what 30 by 30 is nationwide. And Places. Um, and so there, there really is kind of two layers. There is this conserved land that is supporting these values, um, like healthy air, water, soil, wildlife, et cetera, all water, shit, values, all those kind of things. And then there's open space, which is just as important, but open space is a broader definition of that includes recreational fields, um, more developed parkland, uh, potentially farms might fall in open space because, you know, I don't think anything's supposed to be about getting down to the level of cutting out all farms containing some type of development. I mean, they typically contain residents, farms, and structures, and most farms are free to add and change that. So, you know, I do think we need kind of this hierarchy of categories and what you have for 30 to 30 is get on. But that's kind of a lot of the discussion we've had in terms of how do we get to this 30%. You get office use the Bridgeton example and you just add the word conservation in as one of the categories. Like open space is the constellation of natural, undeveloped, served, or lightly developed land. And then you go on to define each one of those and what's filled in those buckets. And then it's almost like here's your big knives. And then this is conserved open space, you got passive and active. Um, and then where those things fit in. And then it kind of follows through this bucket counts for the 30 by 30 bucket. And then how do you get that bucket bigger? And then this other bucket is equally important. How do you get that bucket bigger to the ordinances? So it's, I mean, that might be a good way to bigger and maybe harder for to it. Yeah. But yeah, we values, but specifics can drill down. But I think adding conservation or conserved land to that description sets it up as its own unique. Um, <clears throat> who was who the gentleman that just talked last? I was I was glad to hear someone mention farmland. Andrew Andrew Mackey. Oh, Scarborough Scarborough. okay. Yeah, I um I I I want us to hearken us back to NERPA, the Natural Resource Protection Act, that prime farmland is a protected resource. That just because there is some development on it doesn't mean that there isn't open space value, which I think we're all 
I think we're all in agreement on. Um, but just knowing how much prime farmland has been converted to housing development in Scarborough, I think is troublesome. And I encourage us to discount the marshland. And so we have to come up with another 15% kind of a thing to offset that. I, I really feel like we need to shoot for the stars and be happy with the moon. Do you know what I mean? To, to excuse me, sorry. Um, to follow up, the next part of this presentation is looking at the, the remaining undeveloped habitat blocks that are not in that original violet color that we saw. So, where if we were to conserve everything that we could possibly conserve, where is it located and how much of it? We have that, so we could talk about that. Um, and I can stop sharing if you yeah, want to. Yeah, I don't expect us to. Really I, I think this is something that we'll talk about for the next four meetings. Um, but it's good to start to wrap your head around it now. And I think the thoughts around um, kind of an overall definition and then getting more clearly defined um, between conservation land and open space and what we call open space doesn't necessarily have to relate to that goal. So it's a good starting point. We can come back to the conversation at the end. So the one thing, one thing about this, you know, just to blend it, sort of get the journalism who, what, why, and how. And that's what we're looking for. I think we should be looking for. The Bridgeton is the, why do we do this? None of the other definitions do anything except say, this, this is how we do it. <laughs> the Bridgeton one tells us why. Why is this important to the community? And then as we go through this, as um, Audit was saying, what constitutes all of these different things? And then who, lots of different actors, and then how? Strategies. Yeah. Well, but I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, so, these were just some examples that we threw up to um, that are kind of based on the original discussion of you know, what do we include, what don't we include. Um, so this is getting into um, the the note that Robin led us into, um, which is if we are going to conserve 700 acres now, whether it's 1700 or not, like more potentially, but if we're going to meet this goal, what is left? So this map shows um, in the darker olive green, um, the all of the purple and green land that you saw. So everything that we called open space. So this is sports fields and um, all of those, all of the um, land trust, marsh, all of the things that we call open space in that initial map. The brown color are the undeveloped habitat blocks that are greater than 10 acres. So we cut out all the little guys, um, but- They're not habitat blocks. They're just undeveloped blocks. They're not habitat blocks. They're, uh, they're undeveloped blocks. I mean, they come from the beginning with habitat, but all they are is undeveloped. They're just undeveloped spaces yeah. um, that yeah. are Privately owned because they were publicly owned, they would be in that darker in the green color. So if we were to conserve every square foot of space left to conserve, we have a maximum of six thousand acres. What percentage is that? Um, thirty thousand, six thousand. Okay. Did you enter? Did you intersect this with the designated growth areas? No, no, not yet. I was on the entire town, but what percent? Some significant percent. So this is as of twenty twenty four. The six thousand acre acres. As of the beginning of the country, I agree. So, I may be thinking of this, but the green is designated to certain land. The green is the same as the purple and the green we showed at the end. So, that's just all the land that we've identified so far as being. In those categories we just talked about, so you may you may decide to take some of those categories out, but that's what we had before. So the brown that shows through that you can see that doesn't have any green on it 
those are basically spaces where um, where Beginning with Habitat program looks at the aerial photos. They put buffers around existing house houses, like to include yards and stuff, and then pull out all the rest of the land that doesn't have any development on it, whether it's a field or a forest or it doesn't. It's not identified particularly as any particular kind of habitat. It's basically just part of what they talk about is, you know, which animals, they have a great slide, of like which animals can live in 20 acre blocks, which animals can live in 100 acre blocks and things like that. So this is trying to pull out which, where those blocks still exist in town. Um, so I think, you know, although there is probably land in other places and when we do the analysis, you may find small pieces that are interconnected pieces, you won't find large pieces anywhere except for where those brown areas are. And so in order to get a sense of what land you have left uh, in the quickest sense that is potential, again, all privately owned. <laughs> so, you know, the potential land that exists in the town that could be uh, in, on a list of, of, of places where you might want to conserve without doing any analysis yet as to which ones are better than other ones. That's what's there. And so the, there's about 5% of the town in that lane area. It just, uh, just, uh, I just want to make two points. One is it would be interesting to drop the marsh off of this map. And I think we would be really shocked at just how little protected open space there is east of the turnpike. Um, and how much opportunity there is east of the turnpike. Um, the other is, um, you know, we do have to realize this is from uh, beginning of habitat in 23, which means their data is probably at least a year old when they put it together. Um, I mean, for example, we have the Downs as an undeveloped block. We know that's being developed. Um, so there are a lot of spots on this map that are ready to drop off. So 6,000 is kind of. Oh, it's a vast overstatement. <laughs> uh, you know, because it, 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 again, it, it's data that's made for statewide, you know, comparisons. It's not parcel specific. It's not town specific. So it's a place to start from. Um, what we mostly wanted to look at and see was like, if you go with the numbers we have, and you need 1,700 more acres, do you have somewhere around 1,700 acres? Do you, yeah. you even get there? Yeah, yeah, was it even possible? Right. So if we're gonna have this conversation, we wanna make sure that at least there's some amount of land that you could look to. Um, I agree that most of it's gonna be west of the turnpike, um, just because of the development that's on the other side, and that you have a lot of conserved land on the other side. I mean, it's a, you know, there's a fairly good amount there, so, you may have gotten all the great spaces. There may, and again, like I said, there may be small connector pieces that make sense. Um, so you just want to be able to get that sense of what you have available. <laughs> and again, not available in the sense that it's available. <laughs> but just possible. 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 30 by 30 is possible. It's um, do we know what the cost of that land would be? We would have no idea and no way to know. I just had a question that blew that was um, sort of just west of that nine, route nine. Um, there's a lot of brown to south of it. There's the broad turn. Yeah. That's broad turn. But also south of that. Yeah. Yeah, and Robin, to your earlier point, west of the turn five is pretty much our limited growth area and it's all brown and it's all well rural farming right. and it's all two acre home for two acres you can only do 25 homes per year uh, it's really limited yeah. yeah and and the majority of the uplands have already been developed or the most upland uh areas have been developed from my time on the planning board which leaves a lot of the wetlands areas so that's why I ask about the value, since the wetlands mm, won't necessarily have a huge value, um, but people who own them will think so. Well, a couple of questions. Number one, my mind is spinning on the marsh, and the only reason it's spinning on the marsh is the marsh is well protected. That that's under state conservation, if not federal. 
So why would we be taking it off? And the only answer I think you could give me would be who owns it? And, and so that doesn't make any sense to it. So it's protected land. But very protected open land. Is migrating to other parts. So yeah, yeah, it, it, it's. So I, I wouldn't throw it away because that's the same. The other thing is in the brown spot. It, it, are the brown spots also apparent when we talk about zoning? In other words, are brown spots in commercial industrial land? Because if it's in there, the value of that land is astronomical. Uh, so nobody's going to want to put anything into conservation in that land because that land is, is just too valuable. Unless you have an ordinance that requires your wet or, or, or And I think that, so the important thing is that, you know, so again, we're going to do this part of it, and then we're going to do a separate analysis that's, you know, to identify, you know, which of those brown areas and perhaps other areas are the most valuable in terms of the things that you want to, you want in conservation as a community, right? So we can do that from a scientific standpoint, and then we're going to add values to that so that we can tease out those areas that, you know, scientifically are good, but also meet your, your values. And, and then we want to take all those brown areas and overlay them. Same thing as we want to do with your existing town on land and say, oh, look, here's one that we think is, you know, really important. So let's work on that one first, right? Or here's one where we know the owner is likely to be open to a conversation. Let's start here. But here's one where the owner wants to give us their land, but except that land doesn't have much value, right? And so with that gives us the the ability to say, eh, no, not so much, right? So I think I think those are the kinds of things that we want to be able to get to in the map that we create that really identifies the community's values with the data. Jamie, do you mind making that big uh, full screen just so that we have just a little more of real estate in this room? I don't know why it's not actually. Uh, you just check it out. Yeah. I'm just going to change the screen. We're going to go to some map stuff here and work with that session on the much square footage as possible. I don't know why it's doing that. Yeah, it's fine. That's better than that. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Cool. Oh. I've got a couple of questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, I, I want, just want to follow up with the last one when somebody says that wetland is not valuable. Wetland is extremely valuable for mitigation to developers. If you've got wetland, you have got gold. Because as a developer comes in, town ordinance goes to work, he, he goes to work. They can't build there because they've got wetland paid. So what they do is look for another place, go to that person and say, if you put your land into conservation, I can count that towards my development and then I can develop. So wetland the capital is very, very expensive to buy nowadays because of that law. And I will also say, uh, you know, wetlands are developable. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. That's uh, there's just a cost to it. You know, the Clean Water Act, uh, Section 404, and the Army Corps regulation of Section 404 does not prohibit development of wetlands. It lays out a process how you have to go about doing it. Um, you have to try to avoid impacts first, and you have to try to minimize, and then you have to mitigate. You can take it all the way through mitigation and develop. It happens every day in Scarborough. Absolutely. So, um, one of the things that came up during the Conservation Commission's discussions was the idea of continuous forest areas as a uh, as important. And it doesn't, I think there's something as we start thinking of categories about, I just wanted to get that all out in this table. And, and when we looked at the map before, there it looked like on the east side there was. Um, there were some small little routes 
this place, and I don't know if those are could be uh, connections from one open space area to another, or right. that's why I said, you know, we'll it won't just be looking at the brown spaces. We'll look at all the spaces, right? Because those connections are important, and and so we'll recognize those. And there is a further map that has uh, those connections on. Or at least the places where you get have that as identified those connections, which may not be the right places. When we talk about, I mean, I've just been looking at, at migratory patterns, birds of movement, the maps of that. I mean, I think that's something to consider as well. Yeah. Because I think we're, we have a lot of birds. So I can, so a little more detail about the way that we uh, go through this process of developing the, the, the spatial data analysis from a scientific standpoint, and then how we add values to it. So the first step is to identify sort of the areas that you all think are important. And we have, we'll show you the ones that we, at least from what we believe so far, we think are the ones. Um, and you can let us know if those are it. This is Topsum. I did this in there a few years ago. Um, and so what we did is we took multiple layers. Each one of these categories has multiple data sets. And, you know, within each one of those, we, we work to figure out, you know, which things, there might be things that are more important than other things. So those got a higher point score. And so you can see in each one, there's sort of a color range. And those are the ones that have the highest score to the lowest score in each category. And then we very scientifically take all that data and smoosh it together <laughs> to create the final matrix, which is basically is literally what I just said. We take all that data, we overlay it, we put it together, and then it, we add up the numbers. That's why it has those little pluses there. So you know, if you have a one in the top one and a three in the second one, and they all overlap each other. So basically, you know, the matrix is giving us the places where the most things overlap, right? But we've already added a little bit of information into those spaces by saying, you know, perhaps wetlands are more important than, you know, or forests are more important than grasslands or, you know, however we're going to come up with that information. And then we get it all put together into this base matrix. And then what we do is we ask people of those six categories, which ones do you think are, mo are most important for the, if the town is going to invest in protecting things. Which of those six things do you think are most important? And then we again multiply the values in the order that we get from the public input, and it just changes the colors on you know on the bottom one. So it'll tweak out the things that you value most. Even though you know we have the base one, we can always look at that one. But then we would also add to that the one that includes your values. And so that's how that's sort of a very simplistic. But that is really the process. There's no rocket science involved. <laughs> it's just taking a lot of data, trying to be very thoughtful about how you overlay it, where you bring it together, and then putting it in the proper category so that people can have an understanding of the different things you're talking about and be able to then uh, identify what which things they value most. I'm, I'm assuming that everyone values all the things, right? <laughs> but since there's always a limited amount of land time, money, and people, <laughs> we have to sometimes pick between them. And if you had to pick, which ones would you pick as, as being valuable to you? Yeah, like Maggie's point, adjacency to a right. greater might have a higher effect. Exactly. Yes. Than something else, right? So it totally. just moves up a little bit. Yep. So then, as Jane pointed out, the end result is a map that's that heat map that Jamie mentioned, the high, medium, and low to prioritize. Um, and of course, we start with the existing conditions data. So that's what Madeline is going to walk you through so that you can see what we're starting with. Much like the existing open space, there's things that we missed or we um, have any more information to give us on. Certainly, let us know. So um, like Judy said, we sort of pulled out the categories that from our conversations we thought might be the most important cat categories to Scarborough, and we can talk about whether or not they are. Um, and then for each of these categories, we pull together all of the data that's available um, 
from the state and different sources. Um, and we have some maps up that show all of that. But just to give you an overview, um, we have a habitat map that has um, some different types of important habitat, like deer wintering areas, uh, tidal and inland leading bird habitat, um, and other things from big inland habitat. Um, we also have marsh migration um, data about where marshes may migrate uh, based on different sea level rise scenarios. We have water quality data. Um, well, not water quality data itself, but um, water quality, if you have that as a value, we've identified um, streams, water bodies, and then buffers around them that um, you may value. Um, and then for recreation and connectivity, um, we have data on the town of parks, um, conservation land that currently has public access, and um, the trails overall. And then for agriculture and forestry, I know someone mentioned that farmland um, was important to them to consider for open space. So we have um, the different parcels in Scarborough that are in the current use tax program, which include tree growth parcels, open space parcels, and farmland parcels. Um, and then we also have plant parcels built. So, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> this map is very, very busy because Scarborough has a lot of really important habitat areas. Um, but, yeah. Um, so surprise, surprise, um, <laughs> the marsh is the area with um, the greatest concentration of overlapping habitat types, um, including, oh, no, you're good. Like zooming, you're good. Kind of balance, zooming in and being able to see these with. Yeah. Let me see if I can change the view again. Mm, let's not do side by side mode. No, that's not helpful. Have uh, floodplains and shoreland zones been included in the riparian blocks? Yes, 250 foot setback. Uh, but floodplains, here FEMA, flood flood maps. Sorry, what was? Say that again, Robin. Uh, floodplains and flood maps, flood insurance, like the FEMA maps, FEMA flood. We have a, a new one too. Oh, great. Yeah, okay, brand new. And that could be a good consideration if, um, like Potsdam, um, we didn't include this category in these maps, but Potsdam had an environmental safety category that we can include the floodplains in, where you identify areas of land where you don't necessarily want people to develop um, or where it would be a hazard to develop and that that way you can weight those lands to acquire them as open space right yeah, yeah. That, that layer plus the brown yeah. Like, yeah. In it. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly so that had so in the the public you know where you would want to build it steep slopes <laughs> flood plains uh coastal bluffs um so this map has um Oh, right. The connectors that Judy was talking about earlier are also in this map. The, they're kind of hard to see, um, but the magenta and orange lines. And so those are areas that um, where there are not currently connections between large um, habitat blocks, but where it could be important to have them. The um, riparian ones are magenta, so they connect areas um, like wetlands or ponds or streams. And the orange ones are um, areas that land habitat that is, dis is, is um, disconnected because of the road. So those are areas where, um, like if you see this area with the green deer wintering area, and then there's an orange connector below it, that little slice of land net adjacent to the road could be really important to serve. So, yeah. 
Anybody have any questions or thoughts about other data that should be included? We have a uh, University of New England student for finishing a project for us. Um, one of the things that I've always kind of proposed in Scarborough is that we use a lot of state data, especially endangered and threatened species. Almost all our endangered and threatened species are in the marsh. Um, and it doesn't really represent the rest of Scarborough and the fact that there are a lot of species of conservation need that never get listed but were potentially down the road get listed. Um, so he is looking at, um, I think it's about 25 to 30 species in several habitat groupings, um, and looking at, uh, what habitat is available for those species and, uh, what is protected, what is protected, like that. Yeah, that would be great. wonderful. Is the, um, the state's endangered species data is not always super Right, like when he's citing those endangered species that happen in the 80s. That is all it is. <laughs> I mean, not that they're all in the 80s, but it's a it, it's not a habitat data, right? It's just somebody said, I saw a cottontail here. And if you look at the data, it says in 1988, and I'm fairly certain that cottontail is still not alive. <laughs> so, you know, we have to circle around it as if that's like important cottontail habitat. And who knows if it is or isn't because it's not habitat based, it is just sighting based. And that is to me not actual data. Right, like because it's not a consistent survey. Nobody went out and did a survey of where cottontails are. Just somebody called them and told them they saw it. Yeah, you're not even done to park. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I, I'm a little suspect of that particular data set myself. Um, it would be great to have some local. Yeah, so any data that gives us a little bit better view of habitat wide information is very useful. So, and we'll provide you with all of these maps so that you can look at them because I don't expect you to like be able to look at them and go, oh, I think you should add them. Yeah, you know, right? We think you can think about it and see if there's stuff that comes to mind. We're throwing a lot of information at you, Michelle. Yeah. And feel free to email us if you have thoughts afterward. Um, so this is the water resources, water quality map. Um, and so like I mentioned before, it has um, all of the different ponds and streams and rivers, Scarborough, and then we include um, beginning with habitats, um, 250 foot buffers, um, and it also includes wetlands. Oh, there's a great quick note on this um, west of the turnpike, all the houses are on uh, wells. So drinking water is much more of a concern west of the turnpike or east of the turnpike where drinking stay away lake water. Right. So if there's a way to look at recharge areas or yep, you can put the aquifers in. Our marsh vibration map. Um, and so it shows in the very, very pale this is where your current uh, tidal marshes are. And then um, getting graded over a, um, the lighter green to the darker green are the different, three different sea level rise areas from one foot of sea level rise to two feet. So I'd like to see this include the state designated 1.5 and 3.9 instead of the one, they, two, three. They haven't updated the marsh migration with folks, as far as I know. Okay. No different than I do. Uh, when they did the marsh migration data, they have updated it when they've updated the- um, Interesting. I can talk to Pete Slavinsky and ask him if you have any better data than that. <laughs> But so this is I'm beginning, this is Kristen Poirier's um, data. Okay. This takes a lot of work to update them. I don't think they try to do that. 
I think they will be updating things. Yeah, you would think since that's what the Maine Climate Council has designated that it would align with that. Yeah. Uh, recreation and connectivity. Uh, I'm showing all of the open space land and the light green, and then uh, all of the trails that uh, we have data for. Um, and the just to note, the blue trail is still composed. It's not something that is exactly designated as a trail, but it's a, a water paddle trail. It's a paddling trail. There's a trail where we're called the Hudson's River Trail. Mm -hmm. You have different, you know, input to pull out point where you can go over the um, you know, first piece of the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the one thing that we were talking about was this would be existing trails, but in terms of there being high value areas to conserve, it may be the space between the trails. So where there's like a break in a trail system or two trail networks that are nearby, but the land between is open that we would be interested in assigning high value to. Our transportation master plan, part of it is to identify trail connection opportunities and it's paralleling this effort. It should be ahead, but it's parallel. Um, so I can get used to the back. I don't know if they've provided that to us, have they? You have it? Are we missing any other trails? I walked one yesterday and got six. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's, I think it might be on there. It's the one at the top of the map. The honey. Yeah. So it's mostly Scarborough Land Trust, but then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I just meant it's designated on here as SLT. Yeah. Okay. The railroad. I think this is just that's the current existing and then the on road. Okay, is that what's the case of that? Is that happening? Just happening? It's yeah. happening. We just don't know when it's happening. <laughs> We're finalizing easements and then it'll go out to bid. So theoretically, it'll go to bid this summer. What project is that, Jane? Hoping for this summer, Robin. And that's for Route 1? That's for it Close the Gap on oh. Eastern Trail. Oh, got it. <laughs> it is CSX that needs to give us the final easement. <laughs> We're getting there. So, yeah, if there's any other trail that we can I mean, I think that we might be able to do the, like on a, do a dotted Eastern trail line for yeah. like what close the gap yeah. will eventually be. Those are the, uh, like a general Anybody wants to go out walking and turn on your <laughs> GPS and send it on their phone and send it to us? You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of waste, agriculture. Yeah, for the agriculture and forestry, we have um, in tan all of the time farming soil. And um, and then the three different colors below that are the different um parcels in the current spoken house. Tree growth is the current use taxation program that allows people to set aside their land. They have to have a 
management plan for the forest on their land, but then they get charged for the for the tree growth. It gets, that doesn't get charged as you know, until they grant until they sell, and then they have yeah, to pay. then they pay like six years back taxes on it. It's, it's, so it's a slight it's a slight protection. I mean, and most of the people who use it at some well, not most. Some of the people who use it, their intention is that they want to protect their woodlots. They use their woodlots, they forest them. Other times, people put it in there knowing that they're going to sell their land and they're willing to pay the penalty. And, yeah, and make the buyer pay the penalty. Yeah. Right. And they, they don't. Right. So we have, we've had a few of those so just in five years change. Yeah. 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 But they are currently, you know, at least it's a good indication of land that is currently being managed as forest. But it's essentially private. It is all. It is private. Yeah, all yeah. private. And it, it's also a good indication that this is developable land. You might want to get ahead of. Right. Yeah. Um, and so other things that we could not, if people have the data for, or um, if anybody knows if there's data on uh, current farms, if that's something that we want to consider um, adding into that. So. I think Andrew Scott sent me a list of current farms that he knows about. And it was really. Yeah detail that we can so at least we can know right yeah 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 we have the map lots we can just okay. that yeah the existing farm that is known is that very light bush that's just another taxation program so. yeah so the farmland the light um teal bluish color is just all of the farmland that's in the current taxation program okay don't know if it's still that way. Uh, no, as long as it's in the in that current use taxation program, it has to be currently okay. farmed. Okay. Yeah. And I think this is as of 2024. Okay. I just got the mm -hmm. current set. So, yeah, so it won't be every farm, but it could be the farms that are using that program. And for sure, main farmland trust is that. Okay. So, and that was going to be are the conserved farms represented on here? There are some big farm there. Trust me, Okay. Um, With so we have those. They would be within the farmland tax program. They should be, they but they might not be. Because they're slight. They usually are. But we have those in. We go we can add them, them here. This is the main part yeah. of the trust. We so we can make sure that we get all those properties that are in. And I'll show you the list of all the other. Yeah, yeah then we add all the everything. Farms. All farms would be good. Yeah. What Tammy just said, conserved farms versus other kind of farms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So main farmland trust, they have like, they're called like forever farms. You might see those signs. And so they have put their farms in conservation. So it will always be farmland. Okay. Yeah, with Scarborough Land Trust. But like we have a current, we have a farm care and I have a farm they like to maintain so far, but the development pressure is really strong and our ordinances don't really do anything to help them maintain it as a farm. So that could be identifying those and then giving us some implementation strategies to help those to stay. Yes, would be really helpful. But right now the the better but it's the best better. <laughs> so can I ask a question regarding this map? Yes. Uh, Say, okay, so I live in Pleasant Hill area and there's all brown soils there because we know this used to be all farmland in the Pleasant Hill neighborhood. Um, so if someone wanted to put, so if that neighborhood banded together and said, you know, we don't want to put ADUs on our land or do any more development, is there any opportunity there for for sort of conservation, I mean, I personally want to put an ADU on my property, but um, <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I guess, what are we, what are we looking at here? Like, what does it mean to the average person living in Pleasant Hill neighborhood? 
Well, and the way we're going to use this in the analysis of where, you know, maybe that hotspot map of where the best places to conserve are is, you know, we would use the prime farmland soils as one of the layers. These all these layers will get put together into a given numbers. And then we would say, you know, so a place that is already in farmland and has good farmland soils, we're we'll probably get a high value. A place that just has farmland soils, the problem that with farmland soils is they're the good soils, right? They're also the good soils for septics. They're also the good soils for, you know, uh, low density residential development. And so um, they have lots of properties that make them valuable for other reasons than just farming. Um, so we would give them a value for the fact that they are farmland soils and it's great to protect them when we could, but they probably won't be as highly valued as an existing farm that's on farmland soils. Although it's always interesting to me that the farms are only about half the time on farmland soils. <laughs> they are also on other soils because they've just figured out how to work with them. Um, so, so we will take this and make it one of the choices of things that people can choose. Um, you know, that, you know, that agriculture and forestry is the thing that's most important to them. And, and, and then we'll, and then we'll tweak that out of the data. Um, is there a way we can, um, so I'm trying not to be too editorial or scathing here, but there has been a lot of development on these prime farmland soils already in the town of Scarborough, which I, f I feel like I've been a, um, the lone voice of, you know, the sky is falling kind of a thing. Is there any way then to move future development or proposed development from these areas into the designated growth areas? Like for example, we missed an opportunity in Oak Hill um, to increase the density by going up higher. I'm, I'm thinking about how we can drive growth patterns and preserve these prime farmlands, what we have left that haven't already been compromised by rapid development in the 90s and early 2000s. Robin, Karen and I, this is Autumn, Karen and I were just talking and I was saying I want to make sure that you add the comp plan designation to add the value and maybe you get credit for it. So if you're in a high growth area, like maybe you have these things that would kind of get you or for you, however you want to see it, but maybe you get credit and it, it decreases. So it's like a positive number if it's you're in the high density area versus the low density. So maybe the, Robin, that can help address yeah, and just as peace like Oak Hill, I'm not going to get a lot of conservation, right? Right, but, right, exactly. It'd be nice if I could get conservation west of the turnpike by allowing density increases in Oak Hill, so right. we can still address housing shortages. But how about that? Yeah, we're always talking about anti sprawl. Is that new thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, or do we have any ordinances around that? Well, we have our comprehensive plan. Yes, west of the turnpike is, except for the Running Hill area, is all rural farming. A little piece of it. Well, yeah. it, so that is like the line is just really easily visualized. And west is, but if you develop it uh, one home per or two acres, that's a definition of sprawl. Right? <laughs> it's kind of, uh, but we have your, where's your own resale industry? Right, right. Not going up. Yeah. Right. And then Payne Road and Run One, those areas are designated for higher density. And we have those ordinances in place. That we, Robin's going to make it a little better. I just feel like there have been some sins of the past that um, I'd like us to really keep in the forefront and mm -hmm. and uh, talk about when it comes to this. This is why I'm going to ask us to aim for the stars and not be happy happy until we have the moon. Um, that you know and not to belabor the point, but the reason that we have all these prime farmland soils is the marsh. The marsh is a big delta. A delta is where all these, you know, have been deposited by glaciers over the years. And that's why we have them. And the health of the marsh depends on it. Is Pete Slavinsky in the room? No. Okay. But, oh, yeah. but way to channel him, Robin. Thanks, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs>
<laughs> so just to kind of pull it back, um, these are the categories that we looked at with the maps even smaller um, <laughs> to sort of reflect the example that Judy showed in top zone and how we can use it in Scarborough, where we have these categories in each category, there are different values when we overlay them on each other. It's fine. Um, now showing the prioritization of where to conserve. And then develop strategies around that. So not only will it be the map, how do we low? That's just a map. Then what can we, what are some tools that we can employ around the high using as well? Areas. But we'll also overlay that now with another level, right? So the comprehensive plan, for example. Yeah, right. It doesn't impact those areas. Yeah, we'll be able to show that with all. I don't need to be on that basis. Correct. I understand what's going to be. So, yeah. But those aren't values. Correct. So. Correct. For sure. Yeah, we talked about um, top plan designated areas, um, potentially linked FEMA. Like if we talk about that environmental safety being an element, unless the FEMA areas want to just get added to the water quality or the water, um, that's kind of another layer. Good thing. I'm really excited about this. I'm just gonna say that because all of this mapping is already just making things that we sort of when we meet with developers, pre application meetings, like we know some things, but having this as a tool is gonna be amazing. So I'm really, really it's gonna be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the last part of our we've got a snap Oh yeah. Oh, I was cutting off the clock. Oh, um, yeah, I'll do this. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Um, so we wanted to touch on public engagement. So um, kind of an understanding of what the game plan was and how are we going to use public engagement to drive that valuing system that we've talked about. Um, so the purpose of the engagement is to learn what the community values are, what do people want to prioritize, are there specific areas in the community we've heard a lot of the reference today that we didn't catch um, habitats or connectivity efforts that might guide the um, the strategies. So um, we are sitting in May. We are looking to have a public meeting. In, sorry, we're looking to have a public meeting in look like in July. At the same time, we want to have this digital platform so that people who can't come to that public meeting can participate in a similar fashion so that we're collecting just so we have two, sort of two platforms, digital and the in, uh, in person, and they sort of mirror each other. And then that autumn digital um, survey will be um, uh, sort of a representation of what we've done. So based on what we heard, this is what the matrix look like, looks like. Here's what your conservation priority map looks like. Does it feel good to you? Like give us your feedback on this one more time before we finalize the plan for the end of the year. So um, that's the timeline. You know, what I've heard is the anti-development movement here, I shouldn't say this, but the, the feeling. Um, is there a counter to anti-development? Is there a way to, to, to frame things in a way that, you know, how do you want the community to feel? Because that's what I've heard over and over again. It doesn't feel like it used to. It doesn't, you know, it, it comes down to that gut feeling thing. So how do you frame it as, as not, uh, you know, things are going to change. Life changes. Communities change. But how do you frame it in a way that um, there's, rather than just saying, what are your values? I mean, that's what I, yeah, but I want to ask people what stuff. Yeah, but I, so, <laughs> but you, we'll, we'll do it. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I totally do. And so when we do the public engagement, we will try to have activities that allow people to have that discussion about, you know, essentially it's going to be what is it that you value, but we won't ask you that because that is sometimes hard to answer. So we'll, yeah, yeah. just some jargon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It gets back to the bridge to description that yeah. Yeah, really plumped by a lot of different things. It wasn't anti development, it wasn't yeah. anything. It's just, but here's why you want to do this. You want to keep the community home. You want to give it right. these types of opportunities. And this particular project that, you know, we're trying, right, we're trying to identify which are those open spaces that are important. You know, what sorts of open spaces are important to you in how you live in this town, right? Like, that's the question. You could protect all kinds of different things. 
but we want to know as a town what are the things that you want to continue to protect and if you're going to aim for putting your energy into something where should it be and this i just have a a question and andrew may be able to answer it better than than anyone it's not it doesn't have to be answered today but somewhere in the discussion if we put out a list of top priority projects then if the town's going to look at purchasing or doing anything like that, you've already put us at a disadvantage in some respects. So I don't know how that gets handled, whether or not there's. Yeah, the map won't have any parcels on it. It'll just be a hotspot map. Right. And it'll have more than one. It won't have one hotspot. You know, it'll, mm -hmm. and it'll show where those where those things that we all those data layers plus how people value those, where those pull out into the most important places. And it won't be by parcel at all. Yeah. Yes, if you want angry people, yeah. point to their land. Parcel yeah. on the map and say the town still a little fire. Yeah. <laughs> we're not going to do that. Make yeah. sure that we're in a good negotiating place. Do you want to chat to? You? And yeah. remember, conservation in Scarborough is done with voluntary members. Right. All voluntary. So, you know, that's why you have different priorities. Yeah. Because some aren't available. Yeah. You want to what is available and what landowners are to talk about conservation. I think it should create a contract. There we go. And Thompson used that in the way that they wrote their ordinances. So certain things, like if you want to put in a, a community solar project, you can't put it on um, the places that you know that are high priority protection areas. Um, or you, you have to, and maybe that they couldn't say you can't, but they don't have a lot of money if you do. And usually that's gonna be you know what towns can do if they can't say can't. Um, you know, and, and the same thing with super subdivisions. Like if you want to put in a subdivision, you're going to put it where we have to, you know, then you're gonna have to pay into a fund so that we can get more open space. Question. Uh, I'm just doing that. Probably going to reach all the community expenses and these are meeting with people self select and show up. Yeah. What happens if we make people who are not uh, not elected to enter? I mean, I think, for example, people who are wealthy landowners who have something to lose or to gain. I mean, but what about sort of the wider community that may not have as much of a skin in the game? Right. You know, and it's hard to come out on a Tuesday night. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to have an online version and we'll, you know, we'll talk about how that gets uh, advertised, but people will be able to do the same exercises through the online. They'll see the maps, they'll be able to draw on the maps.
And we've had pretty good luck in the online engagement that we've been doing recently of getting more people than we than than the usual sometimes. So that seems to be helping. Like when we've had meetings, you know, we might see 30 or 40 for the meeting, and the numbers we're seeing are like 500 plus in the digital realm for engagement. So they know we're going to get 500 people without the meeting, and they're going to meet and do it with 500 right. people. But it would be good, for example, to you know, folks face the farmer's markets or yeah. the supermarkets, yeah. any uh, for, you know, what is our role? Yeah, and right. making, I like the idea of making, yeah, <laughs> you know, as you're going by. Yeah. Yep. Do you want to talk about the two exercises? Yeah. 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 So, um, so in the public meeting and what we'll have online, we'll have two different exercises uh, in general that people will be doing. So one is uh, a mapping exercise where we'll have the maps and let people draw on those maps, like if they think there's stuff missing and leave us notes and be able to put sticky notes on them, but just be able to draw all over them and get us that information so that we can then we'll probably verify it and add it. <laughs> um, and these images are from South Portland open space and Bridgeton open space. So it's like pretty much what you're looking at for the person. And then one of the ways that we get at that value question without asking people what their values are is, um, so we will be making Scarborough money and, and we will give everybody a packet of money and ask, you know, because this is the reality, right? Like, if the town were to have a million dollars to spend on open space, how would you spend it? In which categories would you put this money? And then they could go up, they could put it all in one bucket, they can spread it among all the buckets, um, you know, they can do it the way that they want to, and then we count all the buckets and figure out the percentages, and then that's how we, that's how we reconfigure the matrix, is through that process. Um, I found it fascinating like I love sitting behind the buckets and the most the, the greatest part is that there's people who lobby you know like so one person will be standing there going water quality is the only thing that matters you can put all your money in water quality you know and then someone else will be like why you know and then there people are talking to each other which is one of the most important things that you want to happen that they talk to each other but also you know then we're hearing sort of those nuggets of what people are thinking as they're voting and I'm just thinking I'm just quietly thinking doing that. Um, but I found that using actual like physical money and getting up and walking and putting the money in buckets uh, helps. It's, it works completely and has worked better than like dot moving or because that just feels a little less real. Um, and even though it's not real money, it's still like you have this money and you have this process that you're thinking about. Like, you know, if the town were to have money, what would you do? With it? Um, and so so that seems to work pretty well, those two exercises paired with each other, and it gives people a lot of chance to have input. Um, and then most of the time, what I, most meetings, what I've done is we've counted the money really fast right while we're there, and then reconfigured the map on, on the fly so that people can see the difference right there before they leave. So they get that immediate feedback of that their opinion has mattered. Now, in the end, we'll add in on the online voting as well, but. Um, but at least that gives the people in the room the sense that they've been heard and, you know, and then they're super interested in like, you know, which thing came out to have the most in it and stuff. So, so that's sort of the very broad brush outline of the public meeting, um, but that's enough for one we need for people to work on. That could be fun. I hope so. I, I I intend all public meetings to be fun. And that may get people to come to the next public meeting. <laughs> Maybe that's that. Is that for <laughs> um, from a digital standpoint, so um, we use uh, us um, uh, GIS based software where um, you can drop pins onto a basically. Google Maps that says, you know, this is an important area to conserve, or here's an opportunity to connect two trails, or I saw a bunny here once, or whatever <laughs> you want to drop onto the map. So that drawing and um, physical map augmentation in the meetings is um, it's great and it's really easy to process the data that is already put in digitally. It's actually easier for us to manage the data that we collect through the surveys versus um, we actually have to manually sort of digitize what we learn in person. So that, that exercise 
And then that same value we do as well, we'll call those values, but what, where do you want to spend your money will also be digital. So, um, and we just need to decide, you know, um, details around advertising and, and can, how many times can you participate in the, in the voting? Um, and the idea is for that to kind of align. So if we do have a meeting in July, which tell me if July is a bad time to do this public meeting, if, if that's... So we had talked about July just because we want to make sure that seasonal people are also have the opportunity to participate as well. Um, so is it going to be in person as well? That would be the in person. That's the in person one. But as we were saying, we can do other events like concerts in the park and the farmers market and things like that. But the digital survey would be kind of out there for two months, probably. Yeah, probably. Days, but I feel like it'll stay. They could stay open for at least three months, I guess, really. Um, we have to close it with enough time. So, you know, all the data to analyze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you have, like, um, if you wanted to hit, like, you know, all three concerts in the park or whatever, if it's monthly, like, you could leave it open so that it's available. <laughs> They're weekly, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can decide. I don't so we'll, yeah, so that could be open, you know, in the time when, because obviously August and Sarah, you know, people are just doing much more important things of living their lives, um, you know, and so we can leave it open through September so that people, when they get back, to, you know, into the swing of things in the fall, they can, they can consider this as well. And maybe we do like one more push of communication then. Well, it's also probably good too because a lot of people are enjoying all the open space. Exactly. Have <laughs> exactly. So they're realizing, wow, I wish I could walk here. Yeah. Or, this is a great spot. Yeah. For that. Yeah. Fresh in people's mind. We also have Summerfest in there also, which might be another opportunity to. It's like the third Friday sure, in, in August. So from the standpoint of timing, we are quickly approaching uh, the exhaustion of our bonding authority for conservation. Um, very possible, don't know for sure, very possible it could be exhausted this year. All the bonding wouldn't be used in the effect, but it would be dedicated. Um, so as we talk about this, first of all, the time limit, um, if we were to try to go for an additional bonding authority in November, keep that time limit. Yeah, this is kind of a parallel uh, effort to the the land bond that may be on the ballot in November. Um, Uh, <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> well, you know, I, I understand. You know, I'm not sure that I'm not sure what level we have been. Correct. The amount of money we need to buy some of the dirt in the team based on based on the price of the Yeah. Yeah. It would be helpful looking at this timeline and what you're trying to accomplish with us. Um, have the results of the public meeting digital survey was a table of values to know what people want because it would be very helpful to be able to know going into the referendum whether it really got Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that was our intent where we started in you know, that I showed here October that we are presenting like, this is what it looks like. Yeah, do you guys like and probably with a, an opportunity for. Feedback through that, that would be like an open comment. But so it will be public advertisement of the high low medium priority. Way too late. But okay, <laughs> that's okay. I'm not I'm not faulting you because I understand there's only so much you can do, so that's not a problem. But but anything that we have, yeah, do that in a few weeks, right? right. So but anything that exists, you know, you'll have to use, yeah. Oh, no, I understand. This is what it is. So it's not a problem. Yeah. That we're doing is very, very important. Um, but anything, as, we, as we're as we going through things, as opposed to pushing anything back, I don't bring it to the house. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. We have so much information. Well, and I think 
if the if the public meeting is happening in July, we may be able to have some quotes or some like anecdotal um, information that could be used in in the campaign going yeah. forward. It may not be the best time for certain things. Gosh, let's do it. That's a really good idea. And Robin, you had your hand raised. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, how how did we come up with the value for the land bond? And and we can sideline this without having this information. Are there specific lands that are identified in the land bond? Or did someone just come up with a value to say, we're going to need X millions of dollars to meet our 30 by 30 goal? Uh, no one has come up with anything related to what we need to meet 30 by 30 goal. No one has come up with a value of the land bond at current time. It's, it's bonding authority on a bond. So we are not saying that we are going to issue a bond of this amount. We're saying that we will issue bonding authority. We will issue bonding as we make our purchases over the next few years. Sure. Once the, uh, sure. Once who, sorry. So, uh, who am I talking to? Who is this? Doug Williams. I'm on the Park Conservation Land Board. Okay. So who who identified that maximum value? It hasn't been identified yet. Okay. Good. It will be they'll have to identify it by the summer so that the council can authorize it to go on the ballot, I believe, yeah. is how that no, works. Good. I know yeah, I know how bonds yeah. work. I just want to know that there's a plan. Related. That okay. is not related to the uh to any estimated value of of doing thirty by thirty. <laughs> Is it based on our bonding capacity? Say that again, Robin. Is it based on our bonding capacity? No, it's really based on the residents' appetite and how much they're willing to put aside bond. Uh, I think the loose schedule right now is they're doing a survey. We're hoping that they'll present before the finance committee in June with the results of the survey, make a recommendation for the bond, and then have a workshop in front of the live for final recommendation to the bond amount. So will this project then inform where the bond funds, if approved, will be spent? Down the road, but we won't have the open space plan in time to like strategically say we want 10 million to buy this particular property. Not yeah, there. I think it would be really important to have this roadmap to support that bond. Yeah, okay. that's all that's right. the, the goal. I mean, I, I think we all recognize that this the cart bonding the capacity is not going to get us to 30 by 30, but it will help us move in that direction. So it's and so we, we need to continue approach. to make progress. Yep. Okay. Um you I know we're gonna meet again in June. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so we can go over some of the details of the the July meeting and maybe um, we can talk about setting a date for it yep. separately from this. So Jamie, I've got a hard stop. Thank you for including me. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. Um, this is a great presentation. How do I get this to my board? Other people get to I will leave a copy of it with Jamie today. Yeah, I feel like it should be on the town website, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it will be. Yeah. We're, yeah. Putting together a yeah. town webpage for us, and then we can put all this, yeah, for, you know, direct to doors. <laughs> Yes, and this, um, our meeting today was recorded, so, um, and we'll get it posted. I didn't live stream it on YouTube this time, but it will be available on the town's uh, public meeting YouTube channel as well. Um, so we'll be able, you'll be able to refer people to um, to that. Minutes are going to be generated. We'll include the slides with that and the um, the open space example definitions. Um, and as Autumn said, there's we're we're in the process of setting up a town web page for the open space ad hoc committee that'll kind of have a summary of this process and a lot of the resources that are being developed, um, as well as the linking to. Um, the materials that Viewshed is developing. Yeah, 
Yep. And that will be all digital. That'll be like that. That'll be a Zoom meeting. And we'll kind of show. Yeah. Just start once aware. Yeah. So I think we'll talk about have it focus on the um the open house public meeting, but we can also touch on the resources that we'll want for this committee to um bring the information to into other realms. Yeah. Even though we were all asked, well, I know that was crazy to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we'll make sure we have an open space definition by <laughs> we'll be continuing the conversation. Because it, you know, you take this and you know, cross things out, add things to it, and you know, think about it, then just get those back to us and we can keep collating. Okay, so that's another thing to look at. Yeah. 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 And um if all of the material, if you want to funnel it to me and then we will provide it to view shed just so they're not getting everything in piecemeal, that would yeah. be great. And we are going to yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank I you. really appreciate everything. It's really productive.